The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeefrey. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeefrey's straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeefrey. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 81. Iron Game Chalk Talk is a weekly podcast where I bring you experts in the field to talk shop. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to us on iTunes or YouTube or join the mailing list at ronmckeeper.com to stay up to date with the latest episode or anything else that I have going on. This week, we're excited to have Zach Mathers with us. Zach is the head strength coach, head athletic trainer at the University of Sioux Falls and, and uh we have a connection with Zach, uh, several members of our staff. And so Zach, he came down, spent the day with our staff, and I uh, got to spend about you know 24 hours, uh, 48 hours talking shop with them. And uh, just a great guy, They're doing a fantastic job. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with their program, uh, they were dominant in the NAIA for several years. In fact, my last college game was against Sioux Falls in the national playoffs as as a player. So. Uh, felt that firsthand, and then they've moved up to Division Two, and they've done a fantastic job there as well. And so, you know, we get into uh, you know with our staff, we sit down, and we and, and we get into a lot of things. You know, one is the the athletic trainer, strength coach dynamics, since he's both uh, provides a unique perspective on from that. We talk about the pr- the three principles that he uses to design his uh, strength and conditioning programs, and how he provides coverage. Uh, with a limited staff and obviously limited time where he's having to divide. And, you know, we, we talk a little bit about, uh, you know, for the young strength coaches listening, we talk a little bit about the toughest questions that he asks in the interview process um, that a lot of people get tripped up on. And so uh, I think there's, a, there's something in here for everybody. I think it's a great episode. Zach's a great guy, and I know you're going to get a ton out of it. Before we get started, I want to make sure we recognize our sponsors uh, eliteform.com and ignitionapg.com. Elite, uh, Ignition is a sports performance company based in Cincinnati, Ohio, and and uh, you know we just got word that, that Ignition's coming back on board for 2015 as a sponsor, and, and I couldn't be more more thankful for that, and, and more excited to be continued aligned with a uh, phenomenal company, not just for what they do in the marketplace, but how they do it, and um, I'm real excited. I'm going to have Cliff come on the show and talk about some of the work that he's doing uh, through Ignition in Cincinnati, in the inner city, uh, working with some of the homeless. Uh, that's going to be a Christmas episode, and um, I, I really can't wait to, to share that story with you. I've gone out with him, um, and uh, it really is impactful, Change, you know, changes your life, and, and, and like I said, not only are they – Doing it with their athletes the right way and training with the you know the latest trends and and uh, cutting edge techniques, but you know they're doing it and they're addressing uh, the spirit part of it as well, and and uh, that's what I'm all about. So uh, I'd highly encourage you to check them out. Go to their Facebook page, follow them on Facebook, their Twitter page, whatever, and uh, just stay connected with Ignition and and please reach out to Ignition and Elite Form. And just let them know how much you appreciate them being involved with the show. Also, um, Strength Coach Basic Training is a product that I created for young strength coaches. In this episode, you see us sitting around this, the table. We have uh, weekly meetings where I, I meet with our interns, our, our coaching assistants, and uh, they all go through Strength Coach Basic Training. And, and we created this basically so that people could, could not afford to come down and do an internship, could come in do all the same uh, lectures that we do. So I have the eight uh, lectures uh, that, that correspond with eight projects and assignments that they do. They post them in the group. And this and the reason we moved it to a Facebook group was so that there could be more a, of a community aspect. And so we post jobs, we post articles, we post 
videos and manuals and, and all kinds of stuff. So it really is a cool community. Uh, if you're interested in that, go to strengthcoachbasictraining.com, sign up, and then we'll add you to the Facebook group, and uh, and we'll go from there. So I want to get to the episode. I know you're going to get a ton out of this. Take lots of notes, and we'll see you on the other side. I'm head strength coach over at uh, Sioux Falls University in South Dakota. Um, before that, he was a uh, strength coach and uh, trainer at CNOS um, Surgery Center in <coughs> Sioux City, Iowa. Um, that's kind of where I met him. He was my head strength coach at Morningside for two years. Um, then he got me at my first GA spot with that company. Um, worked under him for a year before he uh, got the job at Sioux Falls and went up there. Um, he's been a really good mentor to me. He's taught me a lot about the, the field of strength conditioning as well as just being a, a good friend and mentor as, as a person as well. So um, really close guy, really great guy. Um, I'm, I'm excited for you guys to meet him and, and sit around and talk with him. Awesome. Zach, go, go in a little bit, kind of how you got into the field. You kind of talked a little bit, but what, what made you go into the field and kind of how you got to, kind of how, what led to you being the head trainer and the head strength coach at Sioux Falls? I went to uh, probably a pretty non traditional route for a head strength coach, I think it would be very, very safe to say. Um, I started out as an athletic training major in college at Univista University, a small Division three school in Iowa. Um, after that, I got a job right away at that company that Coach Fink mentioned, CNOS, uh, stands for Center for Neurosciences, Orthopedics, and Spine. I started out as our head of the, just an athletic trainer. I covered actually eight high schools, so I just had a big, long road trip I covered. Um, throughout that whole time, I was very interested in, in sports performance and did some stuff. At, at CNOS, we ran summer camps at that point in time. Um, so we had an eight-week summer camp that we did, four weeks before the 4th of July, four weeks after the 4th of July. We had those. There's probably 250 or so athletes that we ran through every summer. Not a huge number, but pretty, I mean, for what we were doing, that was just kind of our how our trainers filled our summer months and stayed busy. Um, we did, I did that for about three years, and then we decided that was a pretty good moneymaker for us. I wanted to grow that, so I took a position as the director of what we called our power and performance programs. Um, in about three years, we jumped from about 250 to about five or 6,000 athletes throughout the Sioux City area. And that, at that point in time, I think that's when Coach Fink was coming through. Once he, I think actually in your summers, we hired him to help in the summers, just as, a, as an intern in the summers, kind of running around, helping out different groups. Um, I think we ended up with, when I left there in 2010, we had 22 high schools. I think we're somewhere between six and 10,000 kids that we work with every single year from grades five up to Morningside College and Briarcliff College, where, where Brian came from. Um, at that point in time, I got a phone call from the University of Sioux Falls. They were making the transition from NAI to, you know, to Division II. They'd never had a strength conditioning coach. Coach Grubb was actually the football strength conditioning coach, if you guys know him, so you can imagine how that went. Strength coach of the year. Yeah, he was the strength coach of the year for NAI. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, but not a big university. We're a private Christian university, not a ton of money. They didn't have enough money to uh, just hire a strength coach, and that's all they did. So they had to kind of combine positions at that time. They didn't have an athletic trainer either. And so since I was certified and marginally qualified in both, I, uh, I took the job. And I've been there for five years now. Um, I'd say right now my I oversee both departments, primarily my time spent in the strength conditioning area. Um, I have a great athletic training staff, which which takes care of a lot of that stuff. And so I kind of just oversee. I, I only work with football from an athletic training perspective, and then I take care of our budget, some of our leadership, some of our staff development type things. And then I'll, from a football perspective, my assistant does all the Kind of the grunt work, I guess. She does a lot of improvements and modalities and rehabilitations and communications. I come in when there's a, a playing time decision, when there's an injury that, that needs a good evaluation, and I communicate with our doctors as well to do that. And she does the rest, but for everything else, um, I'm primarily strength conditioning in that road. So it's an interesting, interesting way to do things. It's very busy. You can kind of imagine that. Um, the one thing I mentioned this to Coach yesterday, we never have the conflicts between strength conditioning and athletic training. Um, <laughs> those conflicts never arise for us. And it's it's uh, something I, I wish we could split at some point in time, and hopefully in the foreseeable future we'll be able to split those into two separate positions, and I'll just take over as the, as the strength 
portion of that, but for right now, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, and I'll, you know, I'll let you guys ask questions here, but you know, one question kind of leads into that that dynamic, that strength coach athletic training dynamic. You know, what's cool is that you have the unique perspective to have to sit in both chairs. You know, and so just looking out at the strength and conditioning profession. What are some positive things that you see happening with that dynamic? And obviously, the negative is like you know people aren't getting along, things like that. How you know what would be advice from both sides of the chair? I think from an athletic training perspective, looking at the strength and conditioning field is just making sure that there's an understanding that there has to be limitations at some point in time. Um, that understanding that there is an injury, whether it be an ankle injury, and they have to get this squat in. Was well, there is there a different modification? Is there a limitation in place that we can utilize to still get them improved to still do that lift? And that's just a small example, but but understand there's going to be limitations at times. There's going to be injuries that require that, and making sure that you're working with the athletic training staff and vice versa to make sure that happens. From the strength staff, it's very nice for us. It's nice again. There's the constant. There's always communication because I, I, mean, I talk to myself probably all the time, way too much anyway, but. The communication is always there that we know what those limitations are, and and I think from a strength conditioning aspect, it really helps me. You know, I, I'll I don't know if we're getting a philosophy at some point in time, but our probably our number one goal is to protect our athletes and reduce the risk of injury. And from that standpoint, you know, I I know what causes the injuries. I have a really great understanding of the biomechanics and the mechanisms of injuries, and, and what's actually going on in the physical therapy aspect of it, the rehabilitation aspect of it. And so I can kind of almost work backwards and, and make sure that we're doing everything possible to protect from those injuries happening. So I think it helps me out with our programming quite a bit that we can look at. And, and prehab is probably kind of a garbage term for it, but, but I still use it. Um, but we'll do a lot of prehab for those injuries and make sure if we see something that's going on, we'll, we'll get on it before it turns into missed practices, missed games, and those types of things. So from that perspective, it's really nice for me, and I think that's where from a strength conditioning staff, you can utilize those athletic trainers to say, hey, I got this kid, this is going on. You know, is there anything that you can see that would help me to make sure he's going? And it might not be something you can program for your entire group, but it could be something where he's staying in. You know, we use the FMS. We don't use it as much as we used to, um, but we still use the FMS. And if something crazy comes up with our FMS, they're going right into our athletic training staff. And they're, they're doing all their rehab and stuff that maybe the rest of my staff isn't quite as quite as well trained to do so and I might not have the time so we'll send them in there either before or after their workouts every day to make sure but I think that's a, it's a good tool to use because I think they are more than just ice and ibuprofen um, not much more sometimes but they are more than ice and ibuprofen and taping guys up so I think you can utilize that their expertise in some of those areas we know the big thing and we talk about this as a staff all the time but to, you know between that, that strength coach athletic training dynamic, you know, such an adversarial type of relationship out there, right? You know, and and, um, and what we have to get our head around is that it's two two totally different professions, right? I, mean, I can't do uh, and this is unique because you, you do both, but like I can't do I, I'm not the I'm not the caregiver, you know, and, and it takes a real special person to be that ultimate caregiver to to always be there for injuries and, and the, the psychology of getting somebody back from an injury and things like that, you know. Um, and they can, and, and our athletic training staff can't necessarily um, do the things that we do, you know. And so, you know, I don't tr I don't pretend to try to do their job, you know. And, and we and we shouldn't as a strength conditioning community. We we should you know we should identify that that's something that we're not qualified to do, you know. Yeah question something yep. that's you know really dynamic about the two hats that you wear you're, you're talking to a table full of strength coaches so is there anything that you see in common strength coach practice that you having an AT background you see and it red flags in your mind like a very common thing that maybe a lot of coaches do in the weight room that you may not like to see um, like any exercises or like combinations or progressions or anything not necessarily I think everybody you know, and again, that's part of my unique route is that I've kind of been at, I've kind of been doing this for 15 years, doing both. So what I see, you know, when I come visit, the one thing I saw this morning is I think your rack had a kid with a knee injury, maybe. Yeah. And had no clue. I asked coach over there, can this kid squat? Haven't heard anything. Roll, you know. And so just 
the communication is probably the biggest thing I see that would ever break down, and that's not, I'm not trying to throw anybody in the bus, I just noticed it this morning, so. But just the communication, and just making sure that there's communication going on. And, that, and that's probably what I talk to my staff more about than anything, is communication with coaches, communication with training staff, communication with your kids, and making sure that they know that you know everything that's going on, and they know everything that's going on, and that, that breakdown is gonna cause more problems than any exercise progressions or exercise selections. Right, what we're trying to do there, so what, I'm assuming you asked Fred. Yeah. Yeah, so He's Fred's our liaison with our athletic right. training staff, you know, and so that's kind of how we got it set up, you guys all know this, you know, and that's the, the advantage we have to have with coaches out there on the floor like we do, is that, you know, we, we identify something, we try, you know, we ask to, to, to confirm, or, you know, where we're at, and then we make the adjustments based on that, you know, and, and um, so it's a positive thing there. You got to you got to know philosophy a little bit. What it, you know kind of what is the philosophy that you guys have there? And maybe you know from a programming standpoint, um, you know with with being in a, in a situation where you're one on or two on 105. You know how do you you uh, implement your programming? And well, our kind of our three major principles we're going to look at is reducing risk of injury, uh, creating power and explosion. We do. Primarily team sports, we don't work in track and field, so almost everything we do is, is kind of what I would consider kind of a power and explosive based sport. And then, you know, train for the sport, um, which kind of more of a recruit talk than it is a strength conditioning talk. But reducing the risk of injury, again, is probably our key thing. We're Division Two, we have smaller numbers. Uh, from a football perspective, we're a no huddle offense, and I was just talking to, to Coach Fink about this. You know, our guys are averaging 105 plays a game. If you've got special teams, and so and we don't have TV timeouts, and so we're rolling. So just making sure we got guys in the field able to practice is extremely important for us. Same thing with you know, basketball, baseball, softball, soccer, volleyball, whatever it is. So keeping our athletes safe and healthy is our priority. Um, do that. We do several different things. You know, ground-based, multi-joint, three-dimensional, kind of all those those buzzwords that you can hear anywhere. But I think what we do that I think separates what we do a little bit that I really hang my hat on is our assessment process. And we use the FMS, um, that's kind of our basis. I don't probably use it the way um, it is in the manual, but I do use it. We test every athlete comes in right away, and that's one of the first things we do. Typically what we see as our freshmen is the same, the same deficiencies all the way across. And so I don't change a lot with it because I already know that they're gonna have a, a single leg strength issue. I know they're gonna have a weak core, I know they're gonna have probably a, an issue with the torsal stability push-up. I know all those things are gonna exist, but I still wanna see it, and I still wanna see that those numbers are there, and if there's any really low numbers, any big time red flags, then we're gonna get it on those right away. Um, I think that part of our assessment has really helped us with the reducing our risk of injuries. Um, we had a really, really good year this year in football, and we've had a good year, again, knock on wood, but we've had a good year in everything else, so just kind of helping us prepare for the, the rigors of that sport. We've been pretty successful at with it. Um, we also do a lot of, and I'm sure you guys do it too, meeting with the coaches to see what the athlete needs, meeting with the athlete to see what they need, um, looking at our injury trends, where those injuries are happening, where they're coming up, is it extended practice time, or are we having an extra amount of concussions or ankle sprains, or what are we what are we seeing? And again, being an athletic trainer, I have access to all that data right away. And so we'll look at that and just kind of look at our programming to make sure that we're getting the right stuff in. Um, we also do a lot of single leg strength. I really believe in single leg strength. I'm still gonna, we're still gonna squat, we're still gonna deadlift, we're still gonna do bilateral stuff. But we're gonna introduce a lot of, um, a lot of single leg strength and pretty heavy and pretty high volume. Uh, I think that's just getting those small supporting muscles and getting that balance of proprioception. It's that's big time for those things. We'll actually turn our, our we use the tier system or kind of my, my version of the tier system. Our tier two on day one. Um, after our hang clean is always a single leg, is always a heavy single leg exercise. And so we're going to put it pretty high up on our priority and make sure we're getting some heavy work done with that, that tier two on day one. Um, then our last thing is just core strength, and I think you guys do a ton of it too, and I'm sure we're pretty similar on that. The better we can control our center mass, the better we can control the things that are going on. It's going to help our balance and our proprioception, our body awareness. So doing a ton of core strength and making sure it's not just so guys can lift their shirts up and look really good. I think that's that's what the, again, that's probably more of a recruit talk than it is for you guys, but um, just making sure that we're hitting. And I, I know you use more muscle, but we use flexion, extension, rotation, 
uh, stabilization and lateral flexion. Those five movements are the ones that we use and we kind of categorize it that way and we try to hit at least two movements or two exercises for each movement every week and with pretty high volume in them. So those are kind of the, the basic things we do and then how we implement those things. I, I really believe in the, the tier system and how it's set up and the total body aspect of every single day. Um, we also, again, everybody's got their own version of everything and I've what I've found is I want to see, um, I probably maybe even added a couple things to it rather than taking out, but I want to see some, we do what we call pre-work every day, which is some of your metabolic work and things like that. Mm -hmm. We'll do pre-work actually from talking to Brian, I mixed in our warm-ups with our pre-work, but we would do an additional mobility session before every workout. So we'll roll, then we'll do some quick feet type stuff, some hurdle mobility, some hip mobility, a little bit of core strength. We'll go right into our first warm-up set and then, then do a mobility exercise or a pre-work exercise. We'll do those. We'll go through our five tiers, which I set up pretty traditionally in that way. And then we'll come down and every single day. I'm working posterior chain. I'm working shoulder and probably two shoulder exercises every single day. The reason for that is we had a lot of shoulders, um, maybe from poor tackling, um, but either way, we had a lot of shoulders. So I thought we had to do a lot more work on our shoulders to make sure that we're, we're prepared for that. And this year it's, it's paid off. I think we had four last year and we had two just your basic reached out, got in a bad position and got yanked back. We had two of those this year. I think we had, I think we had four surgeries last year and only we're gonna have one this year. So just trying to work our way back zero AC springs, you know, things like that and making sure. Um, with our pre-work, um, we also work in um, kind of the concussion reduction exercises, a lot of neck strength um, and things like that. And then we always end every day with, a, with some type of core exercise as well as working something in with our pre-work and our mobility work and our, our pre-warm-up. Um, some other things. We were just talking about this, and now my mind just went blank on the things we just talked about. But, but that's kind of the, that's kind of how we're going to set it up every week and make sure we get through it. Um, I do, sure. yeah. So yeah, Fred, what do you got? Uh, being at the this two level, you talked about your budget and working both. How have you kind of tried, had to go outside of the box with, you know, equipment or you know, make sure was that and getting resources? Yeah. Creativity. We have uh, we have a really good maintenance guy at our complex that can do some stuff for us. So we'll we make we make do with whatever we got. And just so you kind of know what our our facility is, we have a really big and really nice facility. It's it's huge. It's 98 percent of the time it's it's our weight room. And that's all it is. And the other two percent is Wednesday afternoons from. One o'clock to four o'clock, they pull bolt in there. Other than that, it's it's ours, and we have 30 yards of turf. We have a half a basketball court. We have a 40-yard track on the side, which is essentially storage space. But um, and then we have our weight room. But we have six racks, three half racks, three full racks. We have two bars per rack, um, and a one set of dumbbells. And we have some other miscellaneous stuff that we can do, but we don't. And what I, my biggest fight is to get our athletic department and our university to understand that we have to have a budget of some sort, even if it's a hundred bucks, just so I can replace clips or something like that right here. So, um, pretty much, I, I I find what I need, and then I find a way to get it as cheap as I possibly can. You know, PVC pipes are cheap, and we can do a lot of stuff with that. Um, we bought the buffers because I find them on sale at Menards. You know, um, the Tiger Tails that are 60 bucks a piece, um, we find a way to make them for four bucks a piece. And they might not be quite as sturdy, but we can make them for four bucks a piece. You know, a lot of the stuff is the recovery. You know, we, I can't afford foam rollers, so suck it up on PVC pipes is of course something we can go there. But if we got some bad ones, we do have some, I, I made some, we found some, some foam. And again, I have the athletic training budget also, so if we have some, extra, you know, I'll steal a lot of TheraBand from athletic training for our shoulder work and for, you know, our band pull parts we'll use just our thickest TheraBand that we have from athletic training and um, any anything that's once is always the other because we're right next to them. literally you walk out of our weight room, you walk five steps, you're in our athletic training room. So we have that all right there. So 
and then it's just then it's creativity and it was kind of fun sitting with your meeting yesterday just looking at looking at things how you guys look at it with with some resources versus how i look at it with without the resources just kind of really plotting out how how a football group is going to get through that has 24 guys but then um, the one thing we don't have is we have again six racks we have 300 to 350 give or take athletes that we work with and we don't work with track and field so we have two weight rooms one of them's on campus it's a pretty small one so we have two groups every morning at six o'clock one on each in each facility two groups at seven o'clock every day one at each facility and almost everybody has class between eight and noon and then we have a group of one o'clock two thirty three thirty four thirty five thirty every single day and so there's no there's no time in between so mm -hmm. it's just we have to really we have a really big jigsaw puzzle as we're setting up our workouts you know okay football's at one o'clock volleyball's at 230 soccer's at 330 where's volleyball going to be at at 330 if they're not done so that we can make sure soccer's coming in and they can get their workout started and what do we can do that so a lot of it is just making sure it's a lot of it's a lot of prep and a lot of planning and then again if we if we see something we like like your dip attachments that i saw um i got a buddy that's really good at welding and so just see what he can do for us and, and find a way to make it happen you know we had a, a kid made us a track kid who wanted some projects because his dad had a welding shop he wanted to make us kind of prowler type sleds so he went and made us some cool. and they worked and it just stuff like that we just got to constantly find it and then i've i've been there five years now and i've met almost everybody i've essentially i mean I've, I've met all of our donors and so i'm able to kind of at least talk to them and say hey this is a huge need for us this is going to help every single athletics program our coaches are really bought in which kind of how i came in as the first strength coach and kind of what you're going through right now coaches that are kind of set in their ways and it took me three to four years to get them to really buy into what we're doing. But now they're starting to realize it and coaches are even saying, hey, I got I got a couple hundred bucks. Is there something that'll help our team out? Absolutely. And then I have, and I'm talking to you the other day, you have your wish list and your amount of money. And so if anybody calls and has money, I'm like, yep, I got to spend already. Let's roll. You know. And so we'll, we have a lot of stuff like that that we have in place and, and pushing to get some things and, and rolling like that. So long-winded answer to your question. That's good. You guys all know that. I mean, we we kind of have our our one to three to three to five and a five plus plan that you guys all have been working on. And um, you got within that, you have three categories. You have kind of the the clips, the bands, and the, you know the things that are going to have to be repaired and replaced and things like that. That's just that's either annual budget, right, um, or repair budget. Then you have um, then you have this kind of sexy wish list. Of things that you can you can go out and get booster money for, right? Or sell equipment for, or things like that. And then you have the the third category is a coach comes downstairs and it's like, I got some money. Let's what, what can we do to spice this up recruiting wise? Or this is kind of the major wish list, or or the major, um, you know, the thing that you're planning for in your athlete and your in your budget. So breaking it down like that. And I know we had that conversation the other day as well. What about, you know, as so you talk about 300 plus athletes, you know, you're doing athletic training, strength and conditioning, sometimes maintenance, sometimes facilities, sometimes a little bit of everything. How, how do you provide coverage for that? You know, especially being in, like you have yourself in a GA, right? Yep. So being in, in two separate weight rooms. You know. We, I hire good people, mm -hmm. I think is the best thing that I can really trust and like our our GA for athletic training is kind of my right hand man. She, a right hand woman, I guess it would be for that, but she's outstanding. So I can really trust her on a lot of that stuff and, and do those things. And I don't spend a ton of time in the training room um, just as needed. So she kind of takes care of a lot of that. Uh, my GA for athletic training, I think it's maybe similar to how you guys have it, where you guys have your weight room over there and you run it and you run your programs. And we do everything together, we write everything together. Um, he has his his four sports that he really programs for, but then we go through it together. I have my four or five sports that I have six sports, seven sports, something like that, that I program for. And, um, then we go through it just so we're kind of on the same page with whatever in case, you know, there's going to be a situation where he's doing baseball most of the time, but he might have to go take care of something. I got to step in for baseball. We just need to know what's going on. So with the small staff, we have to have that. We have a couple interns that run around typically, um, and we utilize them to help us out, but it's just, 
again, it comes down to really careful planning and scheduling and, and making sure that we're that we're right on and right where we need to be. And, right. Well, how about we go a little bit even further into that and go, uh, you know, on a, in a training session? So it's you, you got the 24 football players out there. Yep. How are you setting up your your like your sight lines? How are you gonna? I mean, is it is it you, you're putting somebody in charge of the rack, one of the athletes in charge of the rack, or are they taking themselves through? We run. Uh, we kind of run on the whistle, so where you guys will kind of go your independent groups. Uh, we'll do everything on a whistle. Um, I'd like to see what my Fitbit would say about how many times I stomp back and forth in front of our racks every day, but um, we go on a whistle. So if we have our hand clean warm up set number one, the whistle blows, and then I'll say you have two and a half minutes to get hand clean warm up set number one done, plus overhead stick squats and leg swings. And in two and a half minutes, the whistle's blown again, you better be back in your rack ready to go for your second set. And so then when we get into our work sets, we're typically between 90 seconds and two minutes on our work sets. And essentially what we're saying there is, because we're gonna have some weight switching, it's gonna be a little heavier and a little more focused. So I'll say, work set number one, we have you know 100 seconds. And so I'll blow the whistle. They all need to get through by the time the next whistle blows for set number two. And so we kind of keep them on that so I can always see what's going on. Um, if we have some interns and we are hiring a second GA, so if you guys are still looking, I know we talked a little bit, but there's somebody looking for a GA, we have a spot starting to open up, we'll have a second GA. So what I'd like to do is, is somewhat how you do it, but we'll have, each of them will have three racks that they kind of make sure, and we'll only have three people going at a time because we don't have that much space, you know, and then I'll, I'll kind of oversee and, and stop around and make corrections as we need to and, and do that. So we keep everything on the whistle, usually through the third tier, and then after that it's kind of, go from there. Um, probably going to utilize how you do it with your four guys and split into two and two. Mm -hmm. I liked how that flows. Or I like the, I did a little bit this morning, but it was a little quicker look, but I like the vision of how that flows. So I think I'm going to try to implement that a little bit. What I have done is, it's kind of similar as if we have some dumbbell stuff. Again, we have 24 guys with one set of dumbbells. We'll never get it done. So what I'll do is I'll take half of them and go, you know, you three racks go over here and get your dumbbell stuff done. You split here, and then we'll split up among the six. So similar to what you've done, yeah. just not quite the same. But I think we're going to try to utilize it a little more like you do it. But just finding a way to make sure that we're getting getting in and out a little more quickly. And we don't have a lot of standing. We hustle through pretty good. I mean, if, if you're looking at even on a you know your heavy squat, you got two minutes, but to get four guys done in your next set, I mean, you got to be you got to be zipping along pretty good, and they got to be switching weights. So you know, one guy's spot and one guy's looking, the other two are looking at their sheet and getting ready to switch weights and kind of like NASCAR pit crew. So I'm not a NASCAR fan, but we wanted to be extremely quick and extremely efficient and get through those things so we can get all our stuff done and done. What do you guys got? How do you normal day set up? What um, time do you get in? Do you get in early? I usually get in between 4.30 and 5. Um, I'm also our facility director to pile on everything. So, uh, so I'll have, you know, I try to keep my email inbox under 10. That's usually my to-do list. And it'll start out at 30 when I get there, get it to under 10. By the time I get back to my computer through the day, it's usually about 90 and cut it down. And a lot of it's garbage. But going through injury reports for all our sports, talking with our staff and things like that. So I'll kind of take care of that right away between 4.30 and um, and 5.30. At 5.30, it's, it's time to get locked into our workout. Uh, I, we usually have a quick meeting with our, our staff before we before the morning just to make sure our day is set up correctly, just a quick you know, two to three minute review. Um, for me, that's I usually just kind of chill out from 5.30 to 5.45. I read, we have a coach's Bible I read every day, um, look through the workout, that kind of stuff, and I'm out there ready to roll. Then workouts at 6 and 7, 8 o'clock, we kind of chill out for about a half hour, 45 minutes. Um, from an efficiency standpoint and from a little bit of a scientific standpoint, we try to do our meetings while we work out. So we'll work out as a staff around 9.30, somewhere in that range. We'll work out for about an hour, take a quick shower. Um, I usually have I have crazy thoughts sometimes, so I'll just talk <laughs> through it. But I think better while I'm, while I'm working out, while I'm active and not just sitting at my desk. Because if I'm sitting at my desk, my phone's here. My computer's digging, I got people coming out, so I just go work out, and we just kind of talk through all our stuff while we work out, anything new we want to put in, and then um, shower quick, eat quick, and then we're back ready to go. And then typically we have that group starting at 1 o'clock, and so we got a little downtime there before we get rolling, and then workouts all afternoon, you know, if 
it's a practice, if it's football practice, I go out and cover practice in GA and intern stay in and finish up workouts. And then, you know, some of what you guys do in practice, I run around, spot the ball, officiate, warm them up, punishments, whatever we need, whatever we need done. I was an old line coach for a day, so our line coach had a baby, so I took a crash course on how to coach old line. Um, so I'd add that to my resume. And then um, finish up our day and then, you know, it kind of stumped this year because of my athletic training. GA has finished up her master's, so she had class on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, so she had to leave at 5.30. So I ran the training room from 5.30 till whatever it was done. Yeah, yeah, doing treatments and supervising our students while I did treatments. And then usually home about 7, right around there. I live two blocks from the stadium, so it's quick to get there and get back. So that's kind of the typical day in season and off season. will be pretty close to the same, just no practice that I cover. So you look around, we obviously we got some high stayers and balance bars and rocket refill, a lot of supplements and stuff. You have a pretty limited budget. You have a you had a, a good a good idea to get around that. So what do you what do you guys do supplementation wise? We do uh, I'm also we got another resume title is I'm also our nutritionist and I set up all of our all of our food, all of our um, meals. Um, Typically not for everybody. Our assistant volleyball coach is awesome, and she's pretty in tune with that, but the female <coughs> her team do that, so I don't have to do much with volleyball, but football, men's and women's basketball set up, or help set up all their meals. Um, our process is education, education, education with their nutrition. And if you drive from campus to our stadium, you cross like 75 fast food restaurants. And so a lot of education on what to eat, when to eat, not to stop there. Uh, we've actually had to go talk to Hardee's because we had a guy that was addicted to monster burgers. So I pretty much went out and said, if you see this guy, call me. And kind of, he was a really fat running back for a while, but we got him straight. But just a lot of education. And then we do chocolate milk, and we keep it really simple. Um, we, we go through probably um, 40 to 50 gallons of chocolate milk per week with our athletes. We have a machine back there and you have the cafeteria. We have the cafeteria deal. It's ice cold. I think it's the best chocolate milk, at least in South Dakota. I'm not sure if this comes over this far with that title, but we do that every day. And then a lot of it, again, is, is education. You know, during fall camp, especially for our football guys, um, they eat every meal of us. And we have snacks in between. Our head coach is bought into it completely, so I get no kickback from him. And he actually gives me more of the budget to make sure we're eating good. Um, so basically what we try to do is we really try to teach them how good they feel when they eat right and show them the things. And so really carefully select them every single meal to make sure they're getting everything they need in. Then we have healthy snacks in between, stuff we give them plus chocolate milk and, and really educate them on the front end. So in the back end, we don't have to worry about it as much. We'll do, uh, we do a weekly newsletter, nutrition only newsletter where we go through and we have a, a simple dorm room recipe um, a simple nutrition tip and then something else quick and easy on there and then with that high V is our big local grocery store I don't know if you had those out here but Midwest Kroger's okay so high V is our Kroger so we'll go through the high V ads and we'll pick out all the things that are on sale that week and then it, it the website kicks it automatically into a word file and then we just attach that word file to the email so they have all the sales and all the things that would be healthy and great for them to eat. We kick that out to them every week. Um, I have probably, you know, three to four meetings a week with athletes individually about their about their weight and about what they can do and how to do it. It might not be like a 20 minute meeting, it might be a five minute conversation, but just kind of talking to them. Again, it's a lot of education, um, but as far as right after a workout, it's we're all chocolate milk. Um, we try to keep them away from the pre-workouts a little bit, um, just with uh, some of the some of the risks maybe involved with that um, from a compliance standpoint, from an NCAA standpoint. Um, but other than that, we do pretty much all chalk them out. And we don't have a lot of guys that are that take that do much more than that. We have a couple that are taking some protein, but otherwise, it's I think we're probably about all chalk them out, and really not much else that our guys or girls will will take. So, I like yeah. That. So at the D2 level, um, it's not like required for any athletes to stay during the summer and work out. Um, so how do you utilize that 
more time off or you just gave us a rundown of what your day was typically like in season and during the school year. Can you tell us like what your typical day is over the summer or how do you utilize your time off? Do you go out, network, get around and or just like relax, enjoy, you know, your life a little bit? <laughs> we actually we're in a pretty good situation. Sioux Falls is a town I mean, it's nothing compared to this area, but we have about a hundred and fifty thousand Probably a little more than that if you count some of the surrounding communities. So there are some job opportunities available. Um, our football guys, actually, we have probably about 70 football guys that stay in the summer, which for our level is just phenomenal. I mean, we, we talk to other people in our conference, and they're at 20, and we're at between 60 and 70, maybe even a couple more. So um, those we still have workouts for every single day, and they changed the D2 rules. Last year, you can't make them stay, but you can actually coach them. It used to be monitor. So you essentially kind of stand there with your hands in their pockets and make sure they're not doing dumb stuff and just can't really coach them, but you can monitor them. Uh, but now you can coach football, and I think this year they're probably, I think they're changing the rest of sports so we can actually coach them, which I think will get a few more to stay. Um, but we have usually around 120 athletes that stick around in the summer, and we work around their jobs completely. We understand that they're not on scholarship. We can't pay them to be there in the summer and take classes. Um, so they have jobs. So we usually actually start at 5.30 or 5.45 in the summer um, and roll through groups until about about 10 o'clock. And then we're off until 4. So I golf. That's what I do. So <laughs> I leave the workout and I go straight to the golf course um, and then uh, come back and get a quick workout. And then our groups start at 4 o'clock. And then we'll have lifting groups, kind of an open, open lifting group from 4 to 6 at night. So we go usually, we get there, I get there still about 4.30 in the summers, and then we start up about 5.30, go until 9 or 10, depending on the day, and then off. And then Fridays, um, Fridays at 10 o'clock, we're, we're closed for the weekend. So we'll try to get uh, the afternoon group, gets moved Monday through Thursday, and then uh, we just do morning workouts on Friday. That way they can get out for the weekend if they need to, and then we can also take some time with our families and, and get out a little bit too. We also take, I think, 4th of July week, we always take completely off. We usually lose 30 of them anyway, so we just take it off and then program around it. For those that aren't there, you know, we, we have a website. It's kind of a work in progress, but it's got all their stuff on I mean, not not any different than most schools do. A website with all the workouts on it. We have video clips of pretty much everything we do. My old GA was a, was, you know, we just go make it. And, go do exercises for about five hours and get videotaped. So he was tired for a couple days, but that's kind of how we did that. And those are all online. They have access to those year round. And a lot of times what they'll do is because we have just kind of a good dispersed, diverse group of kids staying, they'll actually, they might come back for a week and then go back home and do that a couple times. So we'll continue to work pretty hard during the summer, but that's usually a little more laid back for us. But the workouts, we go hard, but not just not as long. What's the uh, what's the best piece of coaching advice you've ever received? Um, I guess received or found or, or saw is that you got to get your athletes to to buy into your program, and you got to develop those relationships with it. I mean, I, it matters. It matters that you write a good quality program. It, it absolutely does. But if your athletes aren't buying into it. And it doesn't matter. So really developing those relationships with your athletes, getting them to buy in, getting them sold on what you're doing. Um, and I, I'd be honest, we, we spend as much time talking X's and O's with our athletes, uh, with our staff, as we do talking about leadership development and communication strategies. And I read, somehow I'll find a well, bus trip self, but you know, I listened to I had a 12 hour road trip where I listened to a book about Navy SEAL training, you know, and stuff like that. So we'll we'll talk about the communication process, leadership development and just how to how to help get kids to buy in and that's probably more than anything, I think that's that's key. I mean, if, you, know, you can write the best program in the world, but if they don't buy into it, it, it makes no difference. So just really working working your butt off. And I think you talk when you're talking you know, about his new job, just putting your time and effort into the kids and into the athletes is gonna pay Huge dividends in what you're doing. Uh, I would uh, I would agree with you 100 percent on athlete buying. It's a, it's essential, and, and to be honest, it's the hardest and most important part of my yeah. job. Um, but 
I want to ask, we're all going to be entering new programs now, eventually here in the future, and I want to know what what would you recommend to promote athlete buy-in from a new guy coming in to with new people being apprehensive about you? Um, communication, communication, communication. Mm -hmm. and just talk to them and talk to them and talk to them, I think. Um, I'm just, like when I came into, Keelan was my big school in Sioux City, and they're perennial champions and everything. So they didn't think they needed to change anything. But, you know, people you can see people are catching up to them. and just talking to them about, you know, here's what we can do. Here's how I can build around what you're doing. Here's here's the things I can do for you. How does this fit into your program? And the bottom line is, you know, whether it's right or wrong, it's their program. You know, it's they're the name of the paper. It's their butt on the line in a lot of situations. So making sure that the head coaches know that you're there to support them, to support their athletes, getting them on the same page with you. So they're hearing it not only from you, but they're hearing it from the head coach, the assistant coach, getting that information out there, uh, talking to the kids as they come in. That hey, I see this is what's happening for you. If we can do this, we can you know we can we can give you two more inches on your vertical jump if we can get you in here doing this, even if it's only twice a week for 20 minutes. We can do these things for you, and this is how it's going to help you on the floor. I mean, I'm I'm a huge communication guy, and that that's probably one of my weaknesses. Especially early on in my career, because I was bullheaded and I, you know, came in swinging a couple of times and struck out pretty hard. So I mean, I learned my lesson hard that it, it has to be, you have to get everyone. I mean, first off, just get everybody on the same page and accept input from your coaching staff. Accept input because if if they're just saying practice over, you know, go get your lift in and get out, you know, or the difference of that and saying, hey, practice over, hey, let's go have a great lift. We gotta get better. We gotta get make sure we're, we're keeping our strength up this season, get in there and knock it out. You know, the difference between those things from their head coach is in terms of their playing time is huge. So getting that head coach on the same page at the end. And then a ton of time, I mean, it's exhausting. Like when you first start out, I and mean, it's still exhausting five years later when I first got to Sioux Falls, get them to buy into making sure that they're on time every day. They gotta be here and they gotta do this and this is how we're gonna do things and change that over. I mean, I, I was, I get home at night I had to start buying Asics shoes that cost three times more than the Under Armour discount I was getting because I was on my feet so much and running around that I was just exhausted. I could barely walk the other day. So I had to, because of just constantly pouring into your athletes and talking to them about every single thing they're doing, why it's going to benefit them, how it's going to help them on the field, and those types of things. So um, I don't think there's any one real trick, but again, communication was one of my weaknesses. And I, I noticed that when I changed that, when I started working more at that, things started coming a lot easier. And so I, I hate to beat a dead horse with that, but I think that's probably the key in accepting input from your coaches and getting them on your same page. It's kind of key. That's you know we talk about that all the time, but it's you know it's communication in that you're, you're talking about their goals and, and you're pointing that out, but then it's education as well. It's saying why we're doing you know what we're doing, you know, and that's why yeah that's why we're that's why you guys are all here is because it's. You got the, the grassroots opportunity to make an impact right away. It's like, hey, you know, this, you know, this, this hurts, or why is this, or why is that? And you're able to explain it right then and there and how it's applicable to their sport. You know, and then beyond communication, it's, 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 they got to see success. You know, and so you got to show them opportunities of where they're getting bigger, they're getting stronger, they're getting more powerful, relate things. And then the last thing is, is that they got to have fun, right? And, and so athletes have fun, well, how? What 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 are some fun things for athletes? Yeah, competition, right? You know, so that, I mean, that's like, what we do this, what we do this morning with the young guys? Play volleyball at the end of it, right? It's, and they were freaking having a blast, you know, because it's competition. Like Shaq Van, doesn't matter if it's checkers or freaking, you know, fourth and one. He he's having fun because it's competition. You know what I mean? Um, and so they do that if again, if you show them. You know, they're, they're perceptive, you know, and, and they know whether or not you, you give a crap about them or not. And so the good thing is you guys see, I mean, you know, every 2.30, you know, 2.30 every day, I, we got freaking 25 freshmen all piled into Fred and Brian's office, you know, because they enjoy being around, you know, around the room. And that's what we got to continue to push, you know, and that's why we're always talking about being positive. Also. If they come in here every time, you don't really talk to them, you don't show them any successes, 
all you do is when you do talk to them, you freaking scream at them. You know, it's not a very motivated environment. They don't want to be around. You know, so it's it's something that we, we constantly we constantly work on as well. Yeah, you know, we want to kind of end this thing because we got to get to the practice. But um, we talked about reading. You know, give us a, give us a a, a, uh, a favorite quote. And then a, a book, app, and website recommendation. Book. Well, give us give us one for strength and one for outside strength. Okay. Um, book outside of strength conditioning is Training Camp by John Gordon. Um, inside strength conditioning. Let's see. I, I really like the Coach of Strength Training Playbook by Joe Ken. That's one I reference a lot um, off the top of my head. Quote wise, I'm usually a huge quote guy, and now I got now I'm going blank on it, of course. <laughs> but um, you know, the I firmly believe any man's finest hour is that moment he's worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle. Just Vince Lombardi is, is always tough to beat. There's some John Wooden ones that that I use quite a bit that I like. I'm, Kind of a huge quote guy, but of course my mind goes blank and it goes out of spot. That's a good one right there. <laughs> Website, I, I bounce around a lot. I like to read a lot. You know, I'm on, I read yours quite a bit. Um, Elite FTS always has some good, interesting, kind of practical stuff on there. Um, what's Mike Boyle's called now? Strength, strengthcoach.com. Yeah. Is that Mike Boyle's that one I'll look at? Quite a bit, and then Big House Power is another one I look at. I'll, I'll reference those a lot when I get time to. What was the last thing? App. App. So one that you use. You know, with your app, it's just for like you know productivity. The weather app is about the only one I use. <laughs> See if I can go golf. See if that out and then, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm not on my phone a heck of a lot, so I mean the. The Outlook app is probably, and the calendar app is probably my biggest thing because all of a sudden I'll beat, but I got a meeting in five minutes. And sure. So probably that's about it. I don't, I'm not on my phone much. I have a Twitter, our, our strength staff has a Twitter account, but I'm not even really sure how to put a lot of stuff on it. The weather one, you know, I have to get in with football, I have to help make sure we're rolling with that stuff. So look at the weather and then the calendar. Yeah. I always have a question that I like to ask every strength coach that I meet. Um, we're all, you know, in the process of searching for jobs and GAs and all that. What's the toughest question you're going to ask a guy that you're interviewing, either for an assistant or a GA or an intern or anything? Um, the one I see that they struggle the most with is people go out and they apply for every job they see, then they get a call back and they have done zero research on who the person is or where they applied at. Um, so when you ask them kind of what do you know about our school and then all of a sudden you surprise them with what our master's programs are in, where we're located and things. I, I, I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but that's the one I see they struggle the most with. Um, the other one I think they struggle the most with is, you know, what are your weaknesses and how do you go about fixing those and then what can you bring to the table is one I'm always going to ask. Like what's the top thing you're going to bring to the table? And then probably my biggest pet peeve is when you call somebody about a job and they don't call you back. You know, and you you apply for the job with me and I'm, you know, out of my 75 to 100 applications that I have for this job, you know, I selected you as one of the top 10 or so people that we're gonna at least talk to first and then I call them and I have to call them three times, which I'm stubborn, so I'm gonna get pissed and just keep calling until <laughs> they <one's laughs> <only> answer, <laughs> you know, or I'm gonna hire somebody first, so just, Kind of those things, I guess, would be the biggest thing. Know where you're applying, know everything you can about it, know everything you can about the person, find out who you know that they know, and, and get your own on that, and then and just answer your phone and, and realize what your strengths and weaknesses are and what you can bring to the table. Thanks. So, I don't know if that answers that, but that's kind that's of the great. things Thanks I see the most that I, that I find guys struggle with, they're real struggle with too. No, that's awesome, it's a good question, it's a good question. Well, guys, he, Coach is going to be around for a little bit longer. He's going to go with us uh, to the game and whatnot. So um, I encourage you to walk by, shake his hand, and thank you for spending some time with us, you know, and, and 
That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors, EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out RonMcKeefrey.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefrey's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefrey in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefrey can be found on Twitter at rmckeefrey, on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash ron.mckeefrey. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.